In the first section, we defined some basic terminology, and now we're going to talk about osteokinematics. So um, we said before that kinematics was the um, a branch of biomechanics that describes the motion of a body without regard to forces that produce the motion. So when we add the um, prefix osteo on it, osteo means bones. So it's basically the movement of bones in the body um, without regard to the forces that move them. So when we are describing the motion of bones, we're always describing them relative to the three cardinal planes of the body sagittal, frontal, and horizontal. So um, here's plain man, and um, the sagittal plane is the cardinal plane that divides the body into left and right halves. So you can think of it as a plane that slices right down the midline, and you have left and right halves. Um, the frontal plane is a front-back division. The horizontal plane is a top-bottom division. Another name for horizontal plane is the transverse plane. So when someone's standing in an anatomical position, the intersection of those three cardinal planes is their center of gravity. And in humans, we all have about the same center of gravity. Um, it is about an inch below our navel or um, at the same level as the second sacral segment, S2. And um, so that is our center of gravity. It's the um, point at which our weight is fairly equal on all sides. And we'll talk about that with regard to stability and balance. And we'll do some fun lab exercises in lab that have to do with that. So um, degrees of freedom refers to the number of planes um, of motion that a joint allows. So different joints have different degrees of freedom. So we have some joints that only move in in one degree, have one degree of freedom, they move in one plane. Like the elbow is a great example of that. And then we have other joints that move in two or three planes. And in chapter two, when we're talking about joints, we will define all of those. So um, we have axes of rotation, and the axis of rotation lies perpendicular to the plane. So um, the, in this picture, the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint, um, is the uh, articulation between the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Um, it is a joint that has three degrees of freedom, so we can move in all three planes. And so with each plane, there is a corresponding axis of rotation. So um, the anterior-posterior axis of rotation, you can imagine if you took a, a skewer and you put it right through your shoulder from anterior to posterior, um, that is your anterior-posterior axis of rotation. It goes perpendicular to the frontal plane. So the anterior-posterior axis is always perpendicular to the frontal plane, and it's the axis of motion for um, frontal plane motion, such as... Um, abduction and adduction, abduction and adduction. Okay, the medial lateral plane, so we're going to take our barbecue skewer again, and we're going to go um, me from medial to lateral through that shoulder joint. So that goes perpendicular to the sagittal plane. That is the axis of rotation for sagittal plane movements, such as elbow flexion extension, or the shoulder, shoulder flexion and extension. Okay, the vertical or longitudinal axis, it's the axis of rotation for the transverse plane movements or horizontal plane movements, and those are always rotational movements. So with the shoulder, we have transverse plane rotation, and you can think of the vertical axis as being like a rotisserie spit going right through the humerus. So it is going right down the middle of the humerus, and that's our axis of rotation. And not coincidentally, it is perpendicular to the horizontal or transverse plane. So um, this lists the, diff the three different planes and the motion that is allowed in them and some examples of each. This is a really good thing to know. <laughs> these, these different, um, this little table kind of sums it all up. So in the sagittal plane, um, and medial lateral axis, we have flexion and extension, 
of all of our joints that do flexion and extension. Um, in the ankle, we have specific names for flexion and extension, which are dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And we'll go through all of these. Um, it's also the uh, plane for backward and forward trunk bending, also known as trunk flexion and extension. Um, the frontal plane um, is the plane of ab and adduction, so it's your jumping jacks plane. Um, so your hips do ab and adduction, your shoulders do ab and adduction, some of the other joints in your body do it. Um, it's also the frontal plane is also the plane for lateral flexion, which is also known as side bending in the trunk. Um, it is the uh, plane for ulnar and radial deviation, which is um, sort of like ab and adduction of the wrists, and inversion and eversion of the foot. And we'll um, look at um, each one of these motions individually. The horizontal plane. Um, it allows internal, also known as medial, rotation, and external, also known as lateral rotation, and then axial rotation of the trunk. So, um, the, so we have those different planes and all those different motions that happen in each plane. You should know this. This is good information to know. So we're going to talk about each of the individual motions. Um, and like the um, kinesiology direction terms, they also, a lot of these motions have um, a motion and the opposite motion. They're pairs that go together. So the first pair is flexion and extension. Um, flexion is the motion of one bone approaching the flexor surface of another. A lot of times the flexor surface is the anterior surface. This is not always the case. There are certain notable exceptions. Um, Extension is approximation of the extensor surfaces of two bones. So if you think about elbow flexion and elbow extension, in elbow flexion, the um, flexor surface of the radius and ulna are moving towards the flexor surface of the humerus. In extension, the extensor surfaces are moving towards each other. So um, usually flexion um, takes you out of anatomical position and extension returns you to anatomical position. Um, in certain joints, such as the shoulder, um, you, can, you can extend beyond anatomical position, and that is sometimes called, called hyperextension. Um, however, in the clinic, normally you say extension instead of hyperextension, um, even though by definition um, extension is returning to anatomical position. In the clinic, when you're measuring shoulder extension, you're not measuring zero, you're measuring hyperextension. And then when, usually people will only use the term hyperextension to refer to things um, that are pathological. So things that don't occur naturally. That's just clinical versus technical terms. Okay, the next pair is abduction and adduction. So abduction is frontal plane movement away from the midline. So that's our jumping jacks. Um, adduction is frontal plane movement toward the midline. So abduction takes the arms or legs out. Adduction brings them back to anatomical position. Okay, and there's our example guy doing it with his shoulder and with his hip. Um, rotation is a bony segment spinning about its longitudinal axis of rotation. So the pair that comes into effect here is internal and external rotation. Usually internal and external rotation refer to the extremities when we're talking about the trunk or the, the head and neck, the axial skeleton. Um, rotation is um, to either direction. Um, internal and external rotation often refers to the extremities. So with internal rotation, the anterior bone surface rotates toward the midline. With external rotation, the anterior bone surface rotates away from the midline. So the guy in the picture doing shoulder internal and external rotation, he's got arrows on his arms. If you, in lab, if you want to draw arrows on your arms, go crazy. You can do that. Circumduction is a circular motion that moves through two planes. It moves through the sagittal plane and the frontal plane. So it's actually a combination between flexion and extension and ab and adduction. So if a joint has... Um, uh, degrees of freedom of at least two, it can do circumduction. So the shoulder can do it, the wrist can do it, the um, 
The elbow cannot do circumduction because it only has one degree of freedom. The hip can do circumduction. So if you have a joint that has at least two degrees of freedom, you will be able to do circumduction. If you only have one, can't do it. There are certain motions that only apply to one or two specific areas of the body. Protraction and retraction are a pair that only apply to the scapulae and the mandible. So protraction protra is translation of the bone away from the midline in a plane parallel to the ground. So it's taking those scapulae apart, parallel to the ground, and retraction is bringing them back together toward the midline in the plane parallel to the ground. With the mandible, it goes forward for protraction and backward for retraction. You can probably tell by the sound of my voice that I'm doing those motions while I'm saying it. So protraction and retraction, they only apply to scapulae and mandible. Um, horizontal adduction and abduction, they are specific to the shoulder only. So um, it's their shoulder motions in the transverse plane, and the starting position is not anatomical position. You're actually starting with your arms at 90 degrees of abduction. Um, so it's like doing a, a chest fly like the guy in the picture is doing. So you start with your um, arms in a T, horizontal adduction, the hands come together, horizontal abduction, extremities move away from the midline. So um, that is a motion that's specific to the shoulder. We only use those terms to describe that one shoulder movement and its return movement. Pronation and supination are terms that describe a motion only at the forearm. And there is pronation and supination of the, um, of the feet and ankles, but those are combination movements. And when we get to chapter 10 on the foot and ankle, we will talk more about what motions go into that combination movement. But when we're talking about pure pronation and supination, we're only talking about the forearm. So pronation is the forearm movement that turns the palm posteriorly, so out of anatomical position and then supination returns it to facing anteriorly into anatomical position. So when the elbow is bent, supination turns the palm up like you're holding a bowl of soup. Pronation turns the palm down. Okay, so that, that combination of movement um, only refers to the forearm. And then we'll talk about the foot and ankle one when we get to chapter 10. Oh, sorry, chapter 11. Anyway, um, radial deviation and ulnar deviation are um, specific names for the wrist that describe ab and adduction, only at the wrist. Radial deviation is a lateral hand movement towards the radius or towards the thumb side. Ulnar deviation is toward the ulna or towards the pinky side. Okay, so it's, you can think of it as ab and adduction of the wrist, but it has that specific name when we're talking about the wrist. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are a specific flexion and extension term that only applies to the ankle. So um, dorsiflexion is sagittal plane ankle motion, bringing the foot upward, bringing the toes upward, really. And plantar flexion is sagittal plane ankle motion, pushing the foot downward like you're stepping on the gas. So um, the sole of the foot is referred to as the plantar surface. So plantar flexion, it goes towards the plantar surface. The top of the foot is referred to as the dorsum. Um, dorsiflexion goes towards the dorsum. Makes sense, right? Inversion and eversion um, are also specific to the foot and ankle. Um, they are a combination of several joint movement in the ankle foot complex um, that move the, the foot and ankle in the frontal plane. Inversion gives you a medial facing sole of the foot. Eversion results in a lateral facing sole of the foot. So those are specific movements that only refer to the ankle. So there are two perspectives of movement at a joint. Um, we're going to call them open chain and closed chain motion. So it all has to do with um, which motion of the bone is relatively fixed and which one is mobile. So um, open chain motion is the movement of a distal segment of bone about a relatively fixed proximal segment. 
So say you're sitting in a chair so that um, the picture A on the left, it, you can imagine someone is sitting in a chair and that is their um, femur and their um, tibia and fibula. Um, when they contract the quadriceps, it results in knee extension, open chain knee extension. You're sitting in a chair, so your femur is relatively, the proximal segment is relatively fixed. Um, the, the least constrained segment is moving, and that is the distal segment. That's an open chain motion. You can also think of open chain motion as the end of it's not touching anything. Closed chain motion is movement of a proximal segment of bone about a relatively fixed distal segment. So in um, picture B, you can imagine somebody sitting in a chair, their feet are fixed, they extend their knees, they're going to stand up. Um, so the feet are fixed, that's the fixed distal segment. The more free segment is the proximal segment, your hips will come up because you extended your knees. That's our closed chain motion. So you can think of the closed chain motion is the end of the extremity is fixed. So um, if I raise my hand in class, that's an open chain upper extremity motion. If I do a push up, that is a closed chain upper extremity motion. So open chain, closed chain. It depends on whether or not the distal segment is fixed.